Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to speak on this topic uh, as a representative of, of work done by a lot of people in this area, uh, and that's in terms of estimating the global health impacts of PM 2.5. So there's a lot of work, uh, you know, in the air pollution and the health impacts literature, investigating air quality health impacts on a variety of scales. And in this particular talk, again, we'll be emphasizing sort of the, the history and the tools that are being used to answer questions about um, air, quality, air pollution health impacts, specifically for PM 2.5, and specifically using methods that are applicable uh, throughout the world to try to get a better sense of the overall uh, burden of disease associated uh, with fine particulate matter. One of the first studies to uh, estimate the anthropogenic impacts on human health throughout the entire world uh, is shown here um, uh, by Annenberg et al. And this is a, a paper in EHP in, in 2010. Um, and this uh, shows model simulations of ozone uh, on the left and surface PM2.5 on the right. These were performed by uh, Larry Horowitz uh, with the Mozart model. Um, and these model estimates were used to calculate the exposure, so essentially the cross product of concentration with population density. And this information is then combined with statistics on the number of people dying owing to particular diseases, and then a function that relates the enhanced risk of dying of that disease owing to a concentration exposure. And so what was unique about this particular study was its scope. Um, there have been previous estimates of health impacts of PM2.5 um, uh, on a bunch of, based on monitoring in a bunch of urban areas throughout the world. And this was published by, by Cohen in 2004, and this came up with a number of 0 0.8 million. But because that study was limited to just the urban areas where there was monitoring, it was far from capturing you know, the, the overall magnitude of the problem in terms of the, the number of people being exposed to air quality. So the numbers coming out of this paper from Annenberg, um, 0.7 million for ozone and 3.7 million for PM2.5, were significantly uh, larger than what had been seen before and, and sort of drew a lot of attention to this issue. It also raises some lingering questions. Um, to what extent uh, is the PM2.5 concentration that goes into this estimate uh, correct? Um, are models of this scale, even if they were correct, sufficient for asking the question about um, air pollution exposure impacts? And so those are sort of two questions that we'll look at uh, throughout the course of this presentation. So really more on the latter question, is the scale of this tool correct for thinking about exposure? Um, when we run global simulations of PM2.5, um, they're often uh, models that have fairly coarse resolution compared to what you might have seen from you know, your local air quality forecast. Um, because of the computational intensity that it takes to compute uh, the predictions of chemistry throughout the globe, the grid cells for these models tend to be hundreds of kilometers on a side. And that's what's shown uh, in this plot here, a, a picture of PM2.5 from a model estimated at the two by two and a half scale. We put that alongside uh, an estimate of population uh, on a log scale. And, and here you see that the concentration gradients predicted by the model uh, are much coarser than the, than the gradients in, in population. The model is going to essentially convolve an exposure in down to you know, uh, you know, in, uh, the center of New York City with exposure in a, in a rural area in eastern Pennsylvania. Um, and that's not because the model itself is incorrect. It may have the average concentration over this grid box uh, estimated very accurately, but it's just a crude estimate in terms of its spatial resolution. It is on the bottom showing some results from a paper uh, from Jason West Group, by Hunter and West, and then a paper um, from Lee et al., which I was involved with through the uh, NASA ACAS project, looking at the impacts of model resolution on estimating PM2.5 health impacts. And so what's shown on the left is an estimate of um, how much of an underestimate you would make, so how much of an error you would make 
by trying to compute a PM2.5 health impact uh, based on an annual average PM2.5 metric, so looking at, at premature mortalities for long-term exposure, if you ran your air pollution model at different resolutions. And this is looking at the contribution to that by, by species. And so for the shorter-lived species, like elemental carbon, sometimes called black carbon, um, the model resolution matters quite a bit. There's a little bit less of an impact on the secondary species, like ammonium sulfate, since this form secondarily in the atmosphere, their concentration distributions tend to be a little bit more spread out, but still you're making an underestimation anywhere between 10 to maybe 40 percent. Um, and here another paper looking at this similar question starting at a, a grid scale of 0.5 by 0.6, so sort of the 50 kilometer scale. How much worse are estimates when you go to the 100 kilometer, 200, 400 kilometer scale compared to a, a 50 kilometer scale model or 0.5 degree model? Um, and again, seeing similar qualitative features in that the exposure estimates could be uh, quite underestimated for the primary species, black carbon, organic carbon, a little bit less so for the secondary species. Um, it could be actually the opposite sign of an error for natural species if you start to go into the model resolution, you know, think that uh, a city center is in the same grid style as a desert, um, you can overestimate exposure in that context. Both of these were studies looking at the U.S. Um, you know, if we do this study in different parts of the world, we don't always find the same sign, the errors of the same magnitude. Um, and that just really depends on the spatial relationship between where people live and where the sources of pollution are. Um, so it's not something that we can just sort of calculate once in the U.S. and correct for globally. It's something that we need to be aware of as an uncertainty in a, in a calculation done at this scale, but somewhere in the range of, of 5 to 40 percent. So, in looking at global scale issues of air pollution, remote sensing measurements have, have played a big part in, in helping us understand what concentration estimates might be in different parts of the world. And so I want to cover how we're getting information from satellites specifically related to PM2.5. And um, on the left here, we've got a schematic of what a satellite sees that is measuring shortwave radiances in order to compute an aerosol optical depth, sometimes called an aerosol optical thickness. Um, it's measuring the shortwave radiation uh, upcoming from the Earth, and this is first information that or radiation comes from the sun. That might be something that is scattered off of the cloud. It might be something that is scattered off of aerosols. There's a certain component of it that is reflecting off the surface of the Earth. Then that is then uh, that radiation itself will interact again with clouds and aerosols, and finally, we see something here in the satellite. So it's a complicated story. It's not just a, a single signal that's related to PM2.5 concentrations at the surface. It has a lot to do with the um, radiation balance in between the surface of the Earth and the satellite, and the fact that you know aerosols themselves don't necessarily always sit right at the surface. Um, the up oh, it's moved. I'm not sure why this blue uh, square has jumped up a little bit. I was trying to highlight uh, the the line that's conveniently crossed out called extinction here. This is a, a plot of the vertical distribution of concentrations for different gases and extinction in the light blue line. This is aerosol extinction. So this is how much radiation it is, is being scattered or absorbed by aerosols as a function of altitude. This sort of tells you, on average, where are the aerosols that are interacting with the radiation that the satellites can see. And for aerosols, you see that, that signal does peak near the surface, um, but it has a fairly significant contribution as you move higher up in the altitude. And so a good half of that signal is maybe below two kilometers, and another half of that signal is above two kilometers. And so what you're seeing in terms of the radiation measurement detected by the satellite is a mix of information collected near the surface with information uh, about aerosols higher up. You can also see on this particular plot that other gases um, have uh, distributions that interact with what would be measured by a satellite that, that peak more sharply near the surface. You can see NO2 standing out here. So you've probably seen a lot of maps of NO2 uh, from satellites and the uh, relationship between those maps and things like emissions from particular sources. Uh, so that relationship is, is more well 
or sorry, more easily defined because NO2 concentrations peak more sharply right at the surface. So this is all to sort of get this question of how closely linked are PM2.5 concentrations at the surface um, to what a satellite sees. And there's a few ways that people have explored this historically. And one is, uh, the first one I'll talk about is sort of a statistical approach. And here's a, uh, a figure from a paper from Engel Cox et al. in 2004. They looked at all of the PM2.5 measurements collected at, at surface monitoring sites in the US, and then they correlated those with aerosol optical depth measurements from the satellite, and then they made a map here of that correlation. The map is sort of smoothed out in space to cover the entire US, um, but that's a smooth surface based on data that was collected just at the places where, where we have those, those point measurements of the actual surface PM2.5. And you can see the correlation um, in some parts of the country, it is quite high, maybe above 0.6 or 0.8. And then other parts of the country, not so high. Um, and this has to do with the aerosol type, the land type, the accuracy of the aerosol optical depth. Um, so within this paper themselves, they say, okay, this is the correlation between what's measured at the surface and what the satellite sees, the total PM2.5. Um, and it's, you know, maybe not the most robust correlation, but if they start to sort the aerosol by aerosol type, by, by dust, uh, by fire, by sea salt, they were actually able to derive um, you know, tighter statistical correlations between aerosol optical depth from a satellite and surface PM2.5. Here's another uh, result from uh, this sort of statistical approach of relating measured PM2.5 to satellite uh, aerosol optical depth. And then here, those statistical relationships were used to then go and predict PM2.5. Ah. Ah, sorry, this is weird. Okay. Um, that, uh, that wasn't used to develop this relationship uh, in, a, in a paper from uh, View et al. And here, what they found is that they could come up with regression relationships between surface PM2.5 and satellite AOD um, that again were okay, that had sort of correlation, uh, uh, low R squared range. Um, but if they started to include other variables in this regression, including you know, uh, land type, distance from the coast, what was the relative humidity, and then also come up with regression specific to specific parts of the country, they were able to make predictions with R squares of, of upwards of 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or 0.7 much more consistently. So over particular regions, if you have some information about sort of the expected properties of the aerosol uh, or the climate, um, then you can make these sorts of statistical inferences about PM25 from a satellite AOD measurement. Another approach to using satellite aerosol optical depth to estimate PM25 is based on introducing a, a chemical transport model into this mix of, of tools being used. And so this is a paper from Ann Van Donkelaar in 2006. And what they did is they used the model in, in this equation over here on the right. They developed what you might call a satellite-based PM2.5 estimate based on the satellite observed aerosol optical depth multiplied by the model surface PM2.5 divided by the model aerosol optical depth. There's sort of two ways to think about this relationship. One is that you have a model PM2.5 and you're really scaling that by the relative difference between the observed and modeled AOD. Or another way to think about this is you've got the satellite observed AOD and you're using the model as a transfer function. You can take the model re relationship between aerosol optical depth, this complicated integrated quantity that covers aerosols all throughout the atmosphere to what's happening at the surface. And so you let the model define that relationship, which as we saw in the previous slides can be quite complex in time and space and can depend upon geophysical properties. And so a model, a three-dimensional chemical transport model can simulate uh, the variability in that relationship around the world. And that relationship can then be applied to estimate the so-called satellite PM25 in different places around the world. An advantage of this approach is that it can provide a, a globally consistent approach. It's based on a global model. It's based on global satellite records. 
Um, and so it, it's not dependent upon you know, the accuracy or the availability of in situ measurements in one particular place as sort of a method of tuning. Um, and this general approach has sort of evolved over the years to incorporate remote sensing from different instruments. Here, this very first paper using this uh, to estimate a satellite PM215 on the top based on AOD from MODIS, and then on the bottom, AOD from MISER, you see uh, very similar sort of broad scale features in the estimated surface PM215, but then also quantitatively, some pretty big difference. The upper plot showing you know, much higher estimates of surface concentrations in, uh, in the US or, or Europe by you know, upwards of, of tens of micrograms per meter cube. So this is sort of an, an initial pass, and over time, uh, this group in particular has advanced the science of using observations from multiple satellites um, and using multiple model simulations to, to develop these sorts of products. So this leads to estimates like what are shown in the upper right from a much more recent paper by the same group where they've estimated surface PM2.5 at the 0.1 degree scale. And this is just going back to this figure to show that PM2.5 estimates of that scale are a much better match in terms of spatial gradients with the gradients in population for estimating exposure. So uh, in 2009, there was a paper from Hoff and Christopher said, remote sensing of particulate pollution from space, have we reached the promised land? Um, you know, so after maybe a decade of research, uh, it seemed quite promising that they would be able to use aerosol optical depth from the satellite to infer surface PM2.5 with sort of a reasonable accuracy. What they meant by the promised land in this particular case was within about 30%. And this paper reviews a bunch of methods, both statistical approaches and geophysical modeling-based approaches um, and so, uh, not long after that, the next year, the next update from Aaron Van Nunkler was this map of surface PM2.5, either the total shown on the left or with dust removed shown on the right. So that on the right, I think, more clearly gives you an indication of anthropogenic PM2.5. And then um, this estimate of surface PM2.5 were used to estimate uh, um, global impacts, health impacts of, of exposure to PM2.5 um, in the paper by Evans et al. So this is the first time that satellite-based information was used to estimate the global health burdens associated with fine particulate matter. And here they're getting a number of, of 2.4 million premature deaths, uh, caused specific premature deaths in, in 2004. Um, Again, the, the science of doing this continues to evolve. Uh, Mike Brower in 2011 took that satellite product and then did a calibration of it to surface observations uh, and, and merged it with a, another model estimate of PM2.5. So I think in the community, there's still, you know, despite having reached uh, the promised land, there's still some uncertainty or, or some hesitation to just use these values uh, that come out of these products because they, they, they do have some uncertainties in them. And so the study took the, the values shown on the previous page, combined them with estimates from a, a different model, with the thought being that the work by Van Dunkelaar et al. used a model called Geoscam. It has its own benefits and strengths. Uh, let's take another model, TM5, let's take the average of those two, and then multiply them by 1.3, raise the power 0.9. Where does that come from? Well, they, they wrangled up all the PM2.5 measurements they could throughout the world, even PM2. Or PM10 measurements, and, and did some corrections of that to PM2.5, and did a global regression of this average TM5 plus satellite based product versus the observed PM2.5, and came up with a power law relationship uh, to correct that product in order to more accurately fit the observed data, which you know, as you're probably aware, it is mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, places like the US, uh, Europe, and China. Um, but that allowed them to then make a, a corrected estimate of PM2.5 elsewhere. And so this is the estimate shown on the right that went into uh, papers from uh, Lim et al. in the Landsat in 2012. This was the Global Burden of Disease Study in 2010. Early, this gets a little bit confusing. There's these things called the Global Burden of Disease Studies that come out periodically. They have a year associated with them, 
Uh, that's not the year that they were published. That's the year kind of the work really got underway. Um, so the GBD 2010 study coming out in 2012 is estimating about 3.2 million premature deaths going to 2.5, with an error estimate of that of somewhere between 2.8 and 3.6. Um, you know, when I presented this to start with, we sort of said there's, there's these kind of statistical approaches that, that take observed PM2.5, take observed AOD, develop a regression relationship, and then go and apply that to AOD in other places. Um, that's sort of one approach. And then there's this other sort of model-based approach. As you can see, those approaches are, are starting to be fused already and already here. I mean, this is essentially a fusion of model-based approaches with a statistical approach. That fusion has advanced uh, considerably since then using hierarchical Bayesian synthesis of satellite derived products along with a bunch of other information. So that other information includes surface observations of PM2.5, geostatistical information such as uh, uh, relative humidity, altitude tends to be a, a very influential factor. And then they also use model predictions of specific components of the PM2.5 they used uh, geostatistical factors like population density. Um, and essentially, you know, kind of anything you can get your hands on that you think might be, uh, you know, a proxy for PM25 concentrations, you can throw into these um, uh, data fusion type algorithms to come up with improved estimates of PM2.5 that can be cross validated at points where you, where you have actual in situ measurements. Um, and so this approach is what was used to estimate exposure in the 2015 Global Burden of Disease Report, which again came out in 2017, uh, with a refined estimate of, of 4.2 million premature deaths. Now, there's many things that are different between the GBD 2010 and 2015 studies, but excuse me, one of them is this estimate of exposure. Um, that being said, I think it's still useful to keep in mind sort of what the limits of, of these data sets are. Um, and we can sort of understand that by looking at the progression or putting two different estimates side by side. On the left is the Van Donkelaar estimate from 2016. On the right, the Shattuck estimate from 2018. Um, plotted on a slightly different scale. Uh, again, very similar features, some slightly different magnitudes. If you look at the, at the top panels here, one thing that you see Actually, you see this in the, in the bottom panels too, in a zoom over West Africa. The Shattuck approach, which brings in geostatistical information, population information, and it's population weighted by country, um, it starts to introduce sort of geopolitical features into the estimate of the PM2.5 itself, which may be fine for a particular application that's more policy related. Uh, but if you're trying to get a sort of best smooth science estimate of what the PM2.5 might be, it might seem a little bit odd that there's this you know, jump in PM2.5 concentrations across a geopolitical boundary. This does give you a better estimate of what the PM2.5 is compared to monitors here versus there, but at least to, to a map that has those, those fingerprints of the, of the data fusion. You also see uh, just sort of what the differences in magnitude can be um, across these different types of products. And, and you know, it it's, may not be surprising to you to um, you know, look into these and see that they, they tend to agree more over the parts of the world where we had more in situ measurements to develop these relationships and, and they can potentially diverge and have larger uncertainties by up to maybe a factor of two or more over parts of the world where um, there aren't that many in situ measurements to calibrate and validate. And so that 30% I think is a, a good estimate of you know, what is our estimate of total population exposed to PM25, but as we zoom in in particular places, um, the uncertainty can be quite a bit larger. As a, as a reference, there's a paper from Xiaomang Jin uh, that came out last year, uh, another uh, HACAST member. She works uh, with Arlene Fiore at HACAST DI, and she was looking at the differences in many different products over the Northeast US and you know, saw similar differences in what the satellite based products estimated in 25. Um, but very similar changes in terms of what are the trends in estimated PM2.5 over the course of a decade. And so I think we, we can say, okay, these, uh, these sorts of approaches, they do have some uncertainty. If you zoom in on one time and place, 
but we're often interested in trends and we're often interested in features over broader areas for longer time periods. Um, so we have to keep in mind how these are being used. Uh, Jean did sort of dig into some of the details that, that drive the uncertainty in these estimates. Um, so trying to understand what are the errors in this relationship between aerosological depth and the ratio PM2.5 to AOD. And there's a few different things that contribute to that. And it depends a little by season, but those are broken out in this plot over here. Some of it has to do with the column mass. So if the models that we're using to derive these and commit derive these relationships have, say, incorrect emissions, they'd have the wrong aerosol mass in the column. Um, that would contribute to this source of error. If the models don't have the vertical mixing correct, that would lead to errors in, in the shape of where the aerosols uh, lie in the vertical, how much are near the surface, how much are up high, that contributes to some of this error. Uncertainties in the relative humidity contribute quite a bit, and then uncertainties in the mass extinction efficiency. The latter is going to be related to the model uh, aerosol composition and size distribution. So you can think about these as you know, uncertainties in our emissions, uncertainties in our ability to model the physics of the atmosphere in terms of uh, transport, vertical transport, or meteorology, and then uncertainties in our ability to model aerosol microphysics. All of those contribute to these sorts of uncertainties in these kinds of products. On the left here is, is, a, is a plot that puts a lot of this uh, sort of together in terms of looking at how estimates of PM2.5 exposure have changed over the years um, in these global burden and disease estimates as different factors of, of these projects have changed. So we're looking at global burden and disease in 2013 versus 2015, and each of these use an exposure estimate, and then they each use a concentration response relationship. So once you know the exposure, then you have to predict an impact on mortality, and that, that latter part is wrapped up in this concentration response relationship. And those in this plot here are called the IERs, Integrated Exposure Response Curves, and they're shown for different diseases. And what you see here is that as you look at two different estimates, say, that have the same concentration response curve, GBD23, or, or GBD, sorry, that have the same um, if you look between these two um, versus these two, uh, these two have the same IER, and these two have the uh, same exposures. So if we're only, you know, if we can hold one of these factors constant and only update the other one, we can sort of see how much does our understanding of the satellite-based or measurement-based exposure govern the changes that we're seeing. You know, is, it, is it 3 million? Is it 4 million? Is it 2.4 million? The changes in these estimates come from both updating our exposure as well as updating the concentration response function. And so in this particular study, showing that there's a 30% change in these estimates owing to you know, evolved understanding of, of where the PM2.5 was. That being said, sometimes there are big jumps in our understanding of concentration response relationships, so these need to be kept in mind as well. Um, here's a, a newer study showing uh, a different concentration response relationship compared to sort of the, the one that was used for global burden of disease. And these relationships show impacts that are essentially you know, almost twice as large. So if we were to use these impacts, we would estimate global burden of disease uh, from PM2.5 upwards of 7 or 8 million, rather than 3 or 4 million. Uh, so there can be very large uncertainties in essentially the epidemiological side of this story. Um, Zhao and Jen's paper also pointed this out. You know, they saw 30% uncertainty on the exposure side and 130% uncertainty on the epidemiological side. So uh, while you know, we are concerned about improving and advancing the science of estimating PM2.5 in space, we're, we're recognizing that that's one part of the overall process of estimating health impacts um, and it's not necessarily the most uncertain part. Lastly, I thought I'd show you some examples of, of how this sort of information is being used to better understand the uh, health impacts of PM2.5 on global scales. This is a, a, a picture from a paper from Chris Malladal, uh, where he looked up at, or compiled uh, the 
rates of, of preterm births and through a literature review of the concentration response relationships for preterm births as a function of PM25, um, we were able to calculate the impact of PM25 on preterm births globally by using this satellite-based PM25 estimate of PM25, satellite-based estimate of PM25 uh, in a globally consistent fashion. So we, we did two things here. One is we, we used this satellite product that I showed you before, which is uh, resolved at, at very fine scales, at the 0.1 degree scales. So we can use that to estimate exposure, I think at scales that are commensurate with the population. But then we're applying our model in a relative fraction to estimate what is the anthropogenic component of that. Um, the satellite is going to see PM2.5 related concentrations, but can't by itself say what fraction of that is owing to human emissions versus natural emissions. So that part, again, we're we're getting from a model. So there's a combination, again, of, of model information, satellite data that allows us to say something about the source of the PM, but also to refine our estimate of the exposure of the PM. And here we are finding that of the 15 million premature births, about 18 to 3.5 of those were associated with exposure to anthropogenic PM2.5. This is another uh, study using a very similar approach. Susan Annenberg at all. We're looking at, at uh, the estimates of the impact of PM2.5 on emergency room visits associated with asthma. So this is the first global study of the impacts of PM2.5 on asthma. And again, using the combination of models and satellite, we're able to estimate exposure at a very high spatial resolution, but also tease out what is the anthropogenic component of that exposure. Um, and that to be about 70% of these, you know, five to 10 million annual asthma visits may be associated with exposure to anthropogenic PM2.5. And then lastly, this could be used, uh, you know, in a more detailed modeling uh, study to look at the impacts of not just anthropogenic PM2.5, but anthropogenic PM2.5 from a very specific sector. This is a paper, another one from Susan Annenberg, um, uh, that used this high resolution satellite to estimate exposure. And then we used models to estimate how that might change in a relative sense owing to NOx emissions that were emitted in excess of current uh, diesel NOx emission standards. And we found that you know, this excess NOx uh, was contributing to upwards of 170,000 premature M2.5 and ozone related deaths. Uh, globally by 2040, and in present day conditions, upwards of 38,000. Um, and these maps here are showing sort of where those were in the world. This helps us sort of motivate, uh, you know, policy work on, on making more stringent emissions controls or compliance with those emissions controls uh, standards. Lastly, uh, uh, well, I <laughs> Additionally, uh, another paper from Susan Annenberg, she's very good at, at cranking out papers, um, uh, was looking specifically at the impacts of uh, PM2.5 in individual cities. Um, so, I, you know, I wouldn't have said that we you know, would have done this 10 years ago, but the science of estimating the PM2.5 concentrations has, has gotten more precise. I mean, I think there's still sort of some caveats about our ability to call out concentrations in any individual city. But certainly, we could look at trends across cities and particular regions. Um, and note that you know, of all of these areas, only 8% of the cities seem to have estimated PM25 lower than WHO guidelines. And then Susan looked at the relationship between this exposure, um, PM2.5 mortality, the um, equivalent CO2 emissions, um, and the carbon footprint in all of these cities versus GDP per capita. And so as you see GDP per capita increasing, PM2.5 tends to go down. Exposure and associated premature mortalities goes down. CO2 emissions don't necessarily go down because a lot of the reductions in PM2.5 here are happening at sort of the, the tailpipe level rather than in terms of reducing energy usage. And so you see the carbon footprint uh, tends to increase with GDP um, 
this sort of uh, you know, interesting paper for peer reasons, but one of them is sort of presenting an opportunity for um, controlling air pollution in ways that are related to reducing energy consumption to improve the air pollution, but also help us reduce both the CO2 emissions and the carbon footprint. So right now there's kind of a disconnect between these policies and for that, you know, that's sort of the pessimistic view of this outcome. A positive view is that there's, there's, a, a, there's an opportunity here to address these problems um, more coherently. See, I'm going to have some time for questions. So maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll skip this last slide and, and jump to future directions so that we have more time for questions. Um, in estimating PM2.5 concentrations using satellite observations, so far all the results that I've shown you have been for total PM2.5. But here's a, a very recent paper from Ben Dunkel et al. estimating species specific concentrations using these sorts of approaches. Again, it's a combination of model information, satellite data. That's sort of the results shown on the left. And on the right are when you combine that with statistical approaches tuned to speciated measurements that are available in the US. And so the, the top row here is for total P25. And then we have for sulfate, ammonium, and nitrate. You see the model itself does okay at getting uh, relationships between these that have fairly high correlation coefficients, but then may have some biases owing to uh, you know, some underestimate or overestimate concentrations from these particular species in the models. These can be corrected via statistical factors that, that enhances both the correlation but also the bias. Um, so these, you know, as I said, what started out as sort of two separate camps, schools of thought, uh, how should we estimate exposure using remote sensing on kind of a global basis, they're, they're really coming together to be one kind of merged method. Um, to evaluate these approaches outside uh, of just you know, the US and North America, um, there's some new and, and promising uh, data sets available. There's the Spartan network, which is a network of speciated PM2.5 filter measurements placed at aeronet sites. So aeronet sites are in locations around the world where we have essentially like an aerosol optical depth measurement, like what would be on a satellite, except it's sitting on the earth pointing up. And we can use that then to study the relationship between AOD and speciated PM2.5. And that's sort of the key variable that drives our ability to estimate exposure in places where we only have a satellite measurement. And then upcoming, in the next few years, we will have a, a satellite called Maya, which will be the first remote sensing mission specifically targeted at looking at air pollution health impacts. Um, so sort of using advanced uh, remote sensing techniques to focus in on, a, on a, not the entire globe, but focus in on, on a subset of cities throughout the world uh, in a way that will allow remote sensing based constraints on the PM25 composition. And this, you know, I think will provide a lot more information for uh, our understanding of, of the global burden of disease, not just total PM25, but having a better understanding of that by species allows us to start to move closer towards understanding you know, what are the what are the activities, the emissions, the processes, natural and genetic that give rise to this, and the most efficient ways to control uh, and reduce these levels of exposure. So I think that's the last slide. Oh, okay, summary slide. Um, models are used to help derive satellite uh, satellite based in point five estimates. Um, these can be useful for, for global modeling studies because they provide sort of this consistent data set everywhere in the world. This combination of satellite based estimates with models allows us to ask questions about the impact of uh, emissions from particular sectors, locations, or changes in response to particular control policies. Uh, I kind of skipped over this third point, so I won't go into that as these questions, but ending on future directions, uh, this really includes this sort of data fusion, you know, machine learning type approaches to throwing all of the information that we have, models, satellites, geophysical properties. Uh, to estimate these relationships, calibrated with in-situ measurements, we can estimate these relationships at a species-specific level and hopefully improve our understanding of are the species-specific or sector-specific health impacts associated with PM2.5. So 
that is actually that was actually last night. Okay. So thank you for your attention, and I tried to leave time for questions. So I guess I'll, I'll pass it back to the, the moderators.